This is a production of Cornell University. Good. Um, before getting into the, the actual seminar, I'd like to uh, acknowledge some of my uh, former graduate students and, uh, and colleagues. Um, Ralph Brown from University of Guelph that uh, did a lot of the work on um, remote sensing in these projects. And then uh, Javad Hakimi, Mary Jasinski, uh, Mathieu Marciniak, David Letterhoff, Jim Wilworth. Uh, we're all graduate students that worked on a lot of these projects, and uh, so I want to acknowledge their hard work. I thought I'd start off with a, a little bit of a, uh, just a funny slide, just to uh, show you what my office sort of looked like almost 30 years ago in Summerland after I left uh, Cornell. And the, the point I wanted to make about this was, you don't see a computer there. In fact, you don't see anything electronic, really. Um, these offices that we were uh, sitting in 30 years ago were not a whole lot different from an office that you would have sat in in the 1920s, really. Uh, you know, lots of paper, a dial phone, no, voice mo no voicemail, no email, um, no computers. And uh, you can imagine just how far we have come in, in the research field in terms of our um, reliance on electronics over the last 30 years. And uh, you know, if you look at my, my office now, um, I, haven't, <laughs> I, I haven't quite got the, the whole idea of the paperless society, obviously. Um, but the main thing is, is this. And we all have computers, we all have voicemail, um, we all have cell phones, very often that take pictures. So there's been a tremendous reliance on computers. Computers that help us write, computers that help us communicate, um, help us um, analyze data, and a number of other things. And so w without electronics, uh, it would be a very, very different world. And Electronics has helped us in horticulture as well. And electronics has helped us in terms of mapping and getting into a whole new uh, scheme of things that I refer to as geomatics, use of GPS, use of uh, GIS, and, uh, and vineyard mapping and uh, horticultural mapping. It doesn't have to be vineyards. It can be orchards. It could be uh, agronomic crops and, and a whole bunch of other things. So what, what I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, today is uh, use of GPS for uh, purposes of site and vine location, um, data acquisition and how we ac acquire data, whether it be from uh, uh, vehicles like planes or, or drones or uh, tethered balloons, and we, we've uh, tried it all, or from, from the ground, and there's uh, lots of ways of doing that. Uh, spectral meters, there's something called Green Seeker, where you can take uh, uh, lateral views of the canopy and, and collect uh, spectral reflectance data uh, from, from that. So there's all kinds of uh, tools out there that we can use. And then there's, of course, the, the whole data analysis and display. What do we do with all this data? Um, and that's where GIS comes in. And uh, ARC is the main uh, GIS program that is used uh, throughout the world now. Uh, when I first started with this in the mid to late 90s, there was a program uh, called Map Info and Vertical Mapper, and so I'm still most familiar with that, so I'm going to have to learn ARC one of these days, probably before Mary Shazinski leaves, because she's the one that's going to have to teach me. And then after this, of course, it's all about data interpretation. Once you've got a map, uh, that's very nice, but uh, how do all the, the different maps integrate with each other? Uh, how can one variable relate to another in terms of spatial variability and things of that nature. And so that's when we start getting into uh, precision viticulture and making use of this to apply different treatments to different parts of uh, individual blocks and getting into things like micro terroirs. So uh, what about just basic site location or basic vine location. This is where we use uh, 
uh, GPS in order to delineate blocks and to uh, uh, geolocate individual vines that we're going to use for, for mapping. And uh, if you go back 15 years, there was not a lot of people that had even heard of GPS. Um, but G GPS had been used for a few years in agronomic crops and was being used for, uh, for the sake of precision, or precision agriculture in soybeans, in wheat, in corn, potatoes, and things of that nature. But it really had not been applied to uh, horticultural crops at that point. This is what we can do. This is a, a vineyard block. This is a, about a 10 acre um, Riesling block and those different uh, numbers on there are elevations. And what it's uh, showing you pretty well is uh, uh, just some high and low elevations. I, I take it this is a, uh, yeah, there we are. Uh, so these kind of red and orange areas are, are the highest elevation zones in the block. And then we've got this kind of a, a little bit of a, a trough in here. And then it goes down in, uh, into a low elevation zone here. And these are all the individual vines that we took data from and we collected a whole layer cake of, of maps uh, from this particular block on, on yield and vine size and, and bricks and uh, titratable acidity and a whole bunch of other things. And then we can see all the different relationships between all these different variables spatially and see what uh, variables happen to uh, correlate with, which, with, uh, with other variables. Now, a lot of these data can be collected from uh, not just from the ground, but from the air. And uh, uh, when I was doing some work with, uh, with Dr. Brown from University of Guelph, we were using um, a small um, a plane such as this with a, a large uh, camera inside, and we took uh, multispectral um, uh, photographs from, from the air from this. Uh, but there's lots, lots of other things that you can use, and uh, there are now um, different kinds of drones and unmanned um, um, objects out there that you can use and uh, attach small cameras to these and they can collect uh, d data for you. They're not cheap, um, but there are some uh, companies out there that are now making use of these, uh, these drones and uh, um, unmanned objects. And then you can collect things from the ground. This is uh, in Champagne, a, a place called Pl uh, Plume Cook. And uh, th this little uh, tractor here has got a, a green seeker uh, mounted to it and a, uh, a multi-spectral camera. And they take it through the, uh, the vineyards and uh, create these different maps eventually from all the, the data that they collect. And what you're seeing in the background here are uh, a whole bunch of different maps that they've created on um, spectral reflectance of the leaves and uh, potential anthocyanins in the, uh, in the fruit and a number of other things. And this is just a, a close up. This is the, the, the green seeker uh, that's uh, measuring spectral reflectance. And uh, here we have a, uh, a multi-spectral camera, you can see all the different lenses in there, and that's mounted, and then they take a whole series of lateral images uh, throughout the vineyard. And the same thing can happen uh, if you want to in, in orchards and things like that. Might be difficult in uh, traditional apple orchards, but I would say in uh, uh, something like a, a, a super spindle or, or some of the more modern uh, uh, trellised orchards, it would work very, very well. Now the type of uh, data that you collect isn't just spectral reflectance. You can collect everything and take all of these data and relate it to um, some of the spectral data that you're collecting. So it could be um, things like um, uh, vine water status and soil water status, and we've done a lot of work like that. Uh, of course, yield. Uh, basic fruit composition, some, some specialized fruit composition such as uh, terpenes and uh, and things like Riesling or uh, anthocyanins and phenolics and things of that nature that you could collect for red wine varieties. And then there's the whole uh, series of soil and uh, uh, vine composition parameters you, you might want to collect, whether it's soil texture, soil composition, uh, petiole composition, and so on and so forth. So you can see that you could create this multi-layered 
uh, set of uh, maps to, to see where, where you're getting uh, different relationships between all these different variables. And then you need to manipulate this data somehow. So once you've got all this data, um, using things like leaf water potential and, and vine size and soil texture as basically treatments and zones within these uh, different uh, vineyard blocks. And then you can look at uh, these different categories and see how they might impact um, uh, wine composition and wine quality. And we've done a lot of that over the years. And then, of course, looking at correlations between the variables and spatial correlations. And then the important thing is temporal stability. Are these different zones going to be uh, stable over time, year after year after year? Are they going to bounce around? And uh, it's very important, especially if you're going to be uh, uh, trying to use some sort of uh, precision agriculture that you have temporally stable zones year after year. So these, uh, for instance, is, uh, are uh, one way of displaying the data. These are some uh, maps that were created from Greenseeker at uh, Plume Cook uh, Vineyard in uh, uh, Champaign. Um, I was over there in, uh, in June. And so there's a whole bunch of different things. Uh, this one is uh, uh, nitrogen status here. Um, unfortunately, I haven't got my glasses on, but you can probably read some of these yourself, particularly if you understand French. Um, but but uh, in some cases, there's things like uh, anthocyanins and, and a number of other things that they can use and uh, look at some of the different zones, um, high nitrogen zones here, lower nitrogen zones in, in this area. And then you can uh, take uh, precision viticulture and you can try to smooth things out and get rid of some of that um, uh, instability and uh, uh, some of that variability that you're finding in those different blocks. Um, with remote sensing, um, generally what we were doing was uh, taking aerial flyovers to, to collect uh, uh, multispectral data and then we would take um, also some multispectral data from the ground in order to uh, not just compare, but also to verify the, the data that we were collecting from the air. And, uh, and then we would need to manipulate this data. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a, a lot of data to collect, and uh, so we need to use some uh, specialized software in order to take those pixels and turn those pixels into maps. And very often, if you happen to have canopy as well as ground cover, you need to get rid of all those pixels that are ground cover so that you just have the canopy data to uh, manipulate and map. Otherwise, uh, uh, you're essentially going to have green um, data all the way across. It works very well in Australia where it's all uh, uh, tilled in between the rows and the only green you have is going to be the uh, uh, the grapevine canopies, but in uh, New York State and uh, Ontario and other parts of uh, especially eastern North America, you've got that uh, ground cover crop that you have to deal with. And this is an example from uh, one of my former graduate students. Um, he's got some different uh, blocks here that uh, he was trying to extract uh, what we call NDVI data, which is Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. It's based on uh, spectral reflectance in the, uh, the green range and in the, uh, the near-infrared range. And so he uh, uh, acquired these different uh, images and then got rid of the uh, uh, cover crop uh, pixels like this, and then from there, uh, created this uh, actual NDVI map, and you can see that it's uh, fairly homogeneous throughout, but there's some uh, zones here of higher NDVI and a small area here where there's lower NDVI. And why do you use this NDVI? Well, because it can relate very closely to things that we're interested in and we feel it are important. These are some uh, data from uh, um, Andrew Lamb et al. from Australia, and you're seeing some uh, uh, relationships here between uh, well, 
inverse relationships between NDVI and things like phenolics, uh, anthocyanins, color, and things of that nature. So generally these uh, low NDVI areas are, are typically uh, related to lower vigor, um, lower yield, and so consequently um, higher color and higher phenolics. All right, um, move on, talk a little bit about da uh, data interpretation and uh, precision viticulture. Um, so precision viticulture, uh, basically how has it been used thus far? It hasn't been something that's been popular and a lot of that is, is that uh, it takes time and uh, you usually need to have a person that is dedicated uh, to collecting these data and interpreting these data for you. It's not something that as a grower, um, it's something you're gonna be able to do in your spare time. I know my, uh, my ex-student, uh, David Letterhoff, was hired specifically by a winemaker in, in uh, British Columbia, and that's what he does. He does only precision viticulture and only data uh, collection and inter interpretation. Uh, so it's going to involve uh, GPS in order to uh, uh, delineate the shapes of blocks, to uh, 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 geolocate vines and, and things like that. And then of course you're going to need to uh, have GIS software in order to manage these data, create the maps, and help you um, look at interrelationships between all these different variables that you're mapping. Um, with uh, agronomic crops, uh, GPS monitors have been um, uh, installed on things like combines, um, other, other harvesting equipment so that you can very precisely map yield and then go in thereafter the following year and try to smooth out some of those um, low yielding areas by uh, adding a little bit more fertilizer, etc., to some of those low yielding areas, a little bit less fertilizer to some of those higher yielding areas. And so you can get some very precise, uh, very location specific uh, yield maps that will help you do that. And uh, it might not just simply be uh, fertilizer rates, it might be things like uh, inoculum rates. In the case of soybeans, it could be seeding rates, lime application, and so on and so forth. And I'll have to say that that's what I thought I was going to do when I first started to get uh, interested in this and uh, started to get familiar with GPS and things like that. But I, I realized that in, in viticulture, it's not going to be about trying to smooth out the, the bumps in the road and to try to get uh, the, the low areas up to, to higher areas and the higher areas down to lower ones. But as much as it is just mapping a particular vineyard block and then maybe creating micro terroir based wines. and embracing that kind of uh, variability that we happen to have in a, in a large vineyard block. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so in viticulture, we're, we're taking these data, we're, we're creating these maps, and uh, seeing what we get, and then seeing if we might be able to make use of this data and uh, create other um, vineyard-specific wines that might actually be block specific wines. So a lot of that's going to be primarily for economic gain. Um, another look at some, uh, some maps from an Australian vineyard. This is from uh, some of Rhett, Rob Bramley's work, uh, who's been doing quite a bit of work with precision viticulture over the years. Um, this first one on the, uh, on the right, or on the left hand side rather, uh, from the Margaret River. Um, showing a Cabernet Sauvignon block, and you can see some uh, low yielding areas here, some higher yielding areas in here. And what they did was they uh, separated um, this fruit um, in accordance to yield, and then produced different wines from, uh, from the different yielding areas, and produced very different wines. So this might have been something that would go into, uh, say, a $35 or $40 bottle of wine, and some of this stuff may have gone into yellowtail or something like that. And so they've been able to produce these different wines and uh, we're trying to do the same in Niagara. Uh, here's an example of uh, how they were able to use uh, GPS 
to see how their pest control practices have been uh, uh, working and see how effective they are. And so these are botrytis severity maps. You can see some areas where it's very severe over in this area and some area, areas where it's uh, not quite as severe uh, over here. So obviously they're going to need to uh, maybe bump up their, uh, their spray program in some parts of this uh, particular block. So on sites to be planted, how can you use this stuff? Well, basically you've got um, a bare canvas. So you, you want to take lots of soil uh, samples, obviously. You can uh, very precisely map that la land in terms of uh, things like soil texture and mineral composition and slope and uh, a number of other variables such as that. And if you're seeing a lot of variability, you might say, well, I think I might want to plant this end of the vineyard um, with a different rootstock. Maybe I want to plant this end of the, the vineyard with uh, uh, something like SO4 because it's a, a heavy clay. I need something that's going to bust through that clay. Uh, at this end of the soil, I've got sand. I, I think maybe I'll, I'll uh, use something like 3309 or uh, Riparia Gloir or something like that. And you can use this information to uh, uh, make choices in terms of not just rootstock, but also uh, planting density, uh, possibly even trellis system. If you're expecting one end of the, the vineyard to, uh, to be a lot more uh, vigorous, you might want to use Scott Henry at, at that end of the vineyard, and you might want to use just a standard VSP at the other end. So there's a lot of things and a lot of uh, uh, different decisions that you can make uh, once you have this information and once it's mapped. Here's, a, here's an example. Um, uh, this is a, a vineyard called Chateau de Charme in uh, uh, St. David's near Ni uh, Niagara on the Lake. Uh, these are two side-by-side uh, -side, uh, Chardonnay blocks. One, as you can see, is uh, very high in sand. We've got about 70 to 82 percent sand in here and then uh, over here it's mostly clay. They planted it all the same. They probably could have planted this at a different planting density and uh, given the vines a little more room um, and planted these a little bit tighter. So there were things that, th that could have been done with had they had this information right from the get-go. On established sites, there are a lot of things you can do as well. Um, uh, things can be precisely mapped, of course, and uh, you can still get all of that soil data, but you can get a lot of other things. You can uh, delineate management zones um, once you know what the yield is, what, what the vine size is, and things like that. Um, you might be able to uh, implement, implement some variable rate technology as a result. But the other thing is, is that if you have some very clear differences in one part of a block versus another, you can create two different products. And those two different products could, um, as I say, uh, um, be used for economic gain. You could uh, produce a very, very high-end wine versus uh, something that's uh, more like a $15 bottle of wine. Um, here's an example. Uh, this is uh, where we were mapping uh, f uh, flavor compounds in Riesling. And this is at uh, Cave Spring Vineyards. And these uh, orange zones here, orange and yellow zones, happen to be the areas um, where we were getting the highest terpene values in the, uh, the Riesling. And there did seem to be some temporal consistency uh, depending on year. Once we got into 2007 here, um, th there happened to be a, a little bit larger area with very high terpenes bec because it happened to be a dry air, uh, uh, season. Uh, berries were smaller, a little more concentrated, and so the, uh, uh, the, the high flavor zone actually increased in size. But generally we're seeing uh, the same kind of temporal consistency. So had this company had this information, uh, they might have wanted to go in and try to uh, uh, pick one zone like this here or here and create a couple of different uh, uh, products as a consequence. 
Why isn't it being used? Well, like most things in horticulture, it's money. And it, it does take uh, time to collect all these data and variable rate technology, of course, isn't cheap. Uh, we've had a couple of growers that have tried to implement some variable rate technology with uh, yield monitors on their harvesters and things like that, and they've given it up mainly because of cost. Um, how, however, uh, we could still uh, collect the data and possibly create different products as a result of that. The other thing is, is the whole temporal stability issue. Here's an example of why it sometimes doesn't work. Uh, my, my colleague Joan Davenport in uh, Washington State did some work with uh, Yield Monitor in Concord Vineyard. And uh, so it's four different years where they've got a, a Yield Monitor mounted on a mechanical harvester. And uh, these uh, kind of red and yellow zones in this block represent the highest yielding areas within that block. And then we get to the following year, and suddenly the yield has dropped considerably, and the uh, pattern of the yield is, is completely different. And then we go to the following year, and it's different once again, and different uh, in, uh, in 2000. So we don't have that temporal stability, and without that, we can't really implement any kind of uh, variable rate technology. It doesn't always happen this way, uh, but very often it does. And this is one case where it does. This is a, a block in Niagara in the Lake uh, near where I live. And uh, these yellow and orange zones happen to be the highest yielding zones. So over a, a five year period, for the most part, we were getting um, high yielding zones in this uh, uh, upper uh, part of the block and lower yielding zones down here. And it's going to bounce around a little bit depending on what kind of a year it is. Precipitation patterns. Um, uh, things, things of that nature. And you can also get spatial um, stability or temp temporal stability in uh, things like bricks and, uh, and other things. This is a, another vineyard and these uh, yellow and orange zones happen to be the highest brick zones as well and they uh, seem to uh, be relatively temporally stable. Um, a little bit larger area here in 2002 because it happened to be a hot, uh, uh, dry summer. So it expanded it's a little bit smaller here. But generally, you're getting that temporal stability. And in, in all of these graphs, the, the scales are different between years. So the, you yeah, the scales are different. Eight equal segments yeah. within the range for each year? Is that that, that's right. What we did, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. What we did was uh, for, for all of the data, we just asked uh, uh, the mapping program to give us uh, uh, six different uh, uh, individual uh, uh, de denominations, and so there was going to be some difference. So there are higher bricks here, for instance, versus uh, a year such as 2001. So there, there are some, uh, some differences there. Okay, uh, move on, talk a little bit about geomatics on a regional basis before I move on and talk about uh, uh, micro terroirs and things like that. This is something you might recognize. This is uh, Seneca Lake, and this is some, uh, some data from, uh, from Bob Seam. Uh, so I acknowledge Bob Seam. Um, what he's got here is uh, based on a whole bunch of um, weather stations uh, along Seneca Lake. And um, this is the Christmas Massacre of 1980. So all of these uh, pink zones here on the west side of Seneca Lake represent cold areas um, just before and, and during the Christmas Massacre. And then uh, after that, that cold air moved across Seneca Lake because Seneca Lake, of course, doesn't freeze. It picked up some, some warm air uh, crossing that lake. And then the, this blue area here is some uh, slightly warmed air um, that, uh, that we see on this side of Seneca Lake. But then once that air moved on and got further away from the lake, it uh, picked up more cold air from the, uh, uh, as a result of continentality. And you see you got cold air um, over here. 
So it just shows the effect of Seneca Lake on a regional basis, even in uh, 1980, where we had uh, temperatures close to minus 30. And there's, uh, I think that was Fahrenheit, wasn't it? It was cold. Yeah, I remember it being very cold. And, and this is something that you can do, of course, and this is just growing degree days in the Napa Valley and some of uh, Paul Skinner's work. Uh, you can see uh, the slightly lower growing degree days down here because of the, uh, the influence of San Francisco Bay. And then as you get further up uh, Napa Valley, you're getting into some uh, higher growing degree days and then uh, drops a little bit once you get up around Calistoga because you're higher elevation and, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's another way you can make use of uh, multiple uh, weather stations and you can map growing degree days and things like that. Um, what I like to spend most of the rest of this talk on is uh, geomatics site and uh, mapping things like yield and vine size and water status. Um, here's an example of a micro terroir. Uh, this is Desolé in Switzerland. And uh, uh, this is uh, next to Lausanne in, in uh, western Switzerland. And all of these different vineyards up and down this uh, hillside here, it's all chassala. Um, the, uh, age of the vines is relatively similar, but because of elevation and a number of other things, these are all different terroirs. And they actually make different wines uh, depending on where along this hillside you're picking those chassala. And they are distinctly different. If you go into some of the wineries there where you can uh, taste some of these different wines, it's uh, quite incredible. It's a, a real educational experience. So this is the kind of thing what, uh, what we wanted to look at. And this is going back to the, the same Riesling vineyard that I showed you near the beginning. This is the St. Urban vineyard. And uh, uh, what we're seeing here are differences in vine size. A high vine size zone here, low vine size zone um, in this area. And in many cases, these uh, vine size or vigor zones can be related to things like yield, um, bricks, uh, flavor and a number of other things. Um, here's our, our friend Chateau de Charme. This is, uh, th these are different yield zones. And those are those two, uh, two Chardonnay blocks side by side. Uh, a low yielding zone here in that sandy block and uh, a high yielding zone uh, next door to it in that uh, heavy clay block. And then this jumped back and forth unfortunately over, over the period of the four years we were collecting data. And then uh, the other thing is, is collecting flavor data and mapping um, flavor. And wouldn't that be great if you could map flavor and create different wines because you know the potential flavor from, from the different zones in that particular block. So high flavor zone here and a relatively lower flavor zone over on this side. Uh, this is a way that uh, it has been used um, commercially. And uh, this is some data from uh, Mark Greenspan when he was working for Gallo back about uh, 10 years ago where he, he went in and used a number of different things, leaf water potential, vine size, um, NDVI data, and uh, combined all of these and created some, uh, uh, some, some maps from this uh, hillside Zinfandel vineyard and created a, a low vigor zone and a high vigor zone and so uh, this low vigor zone went into their $35 uh, Sonoma Reserve and their high vigor zone that probably went into either Rosé or Barefoot or something like that. So different, different products from the, from the same block based on information and just knowing um, what you have there, and the more data you can collect, um, the more money you can make, basically, from a, a given vineyard block. Um, I, I spent a moment just going back to how I got into this in the first place. Um, when I was working in uh, BC in the, uh, the early 90s, um, working with a geologist and uh, did some uh, zoning 
work, but this was before GPS, so we were just using a, a transit and uh, uh, trying to do everything using uh, uh, just old-fashioned uh, uh, elevations and uh, leaf layer numbers and bricks and TA and pH and uh, used Krieging and uh, mapped all these different variables and tried to create some different zones from a, from a small vineyard. And then in the, uh, the later 90s, uh, uh, we had an 85-acre um, vineyard, multi-variety vineyard on, on the hillside and uh, used GPS and G GIS to uh, map a whole bunch of different variables. So this is one example of uh, some of the work we did uh, pre-GPS. We had about 200 different uh, vines that we took uh, samples from in this uh, vigorous Gewurztraminer vineyard uh, next to Skaha Lake in uh, uh, Penticton, BC. Uh, you can see the, the, the vigor there. And what we were trying to do is look at uh, different brick zones. And then uh, once we had those bricks data, uh, try to create some different management zones based on these bricks data. And that was all, as I say, pre-GPS days. And then with uh, the, the stuff at Paradise uh, Vineyard, we actually did have some uh, uh, some geomatic tools, you can uh, get an idea of, uh, uh, this is uh, Lake Okanagan here, so it was a, a steep hillside vineyard um, with a lot of different ravines and things like that all through there. So we had some major um, variability throughout this, uh, this vineyard in terms of uh, not just elevation, but uh, things like vine size and yield and bricks and TA and pH and uh, all the different uh, soil and, and petiole variables as well. All right, um, move on. I'll talk a little bit about uh, geomatics of water status, which was some uh, work that was uh, uh, done starting in 2005. Um, some work by J uh, Jim Wilworth, that's now uh, our extension viticulturist, uh, 2005 to 11, and. Uh, uh, Javad Hakimi, who worked at the same time but on Cabernet Franc. Um, what we did was um, we chose 10 different sites throughout the Niagara Peninsula. There's Lake Ontario here. Um, each of these sites represented a specific uh, sub appellation. So we had 10 different sub appellations throughout there and tried to pick out uh, uh, representative vineyards in each of those different sub appellations for uh, both. Riesling and uh, Cabernet Franc, and ran this project over a three-year period, mapped uh, things such as um, um, leaf water potential and, and soil moisture, and went in there on a bi-weekly basis to collect these data, and then in the, in the fall collect data on uh, uh, things such as, uh, uh, you know, clusters per vine and yield and uh, uh, standard berry composition, <clears throat> and in uh, Riesling we were collecting ber uh, terpenes for the berries and for the Cabernet Franc, uh, phenolics, anthocyanins, and color, and things of that nature. And this gives you some idea, I'll uh, walk you through um, one site for Riesling to just give you some idea of what we were finding. And this is the Myers Vineyard on the lake. Um, here we have leaf water potential, so the one thing to, to point out, uh, we've got uh, low leaf water potential here, so this was uh, uh, the southern end of the vineyard, and it was uh, somewhat under water stress each year, and then uh, higher leaf water potential in the northern end of the vineyard. Nice temporal stability, uh, we were glad to see this. Um, you'll notice that the, the numbers are a little bit different, uh, 2007, we were getting numbers in the uh, minus 12 to mi almost minus 13 range. It was a, a dry year, and it was a, they were not quite as low in 2005 and 2006. Now we start to see how these relate to other things that are important. Uh, first of all, um, up here where we had the uh, um, higher leaf water potential, we, we've also got higher soil moisture, and we've also got higher vine size. So more vigor, uh, higher soil moisture, higher leaf water potential. So already some nice relationships. 
as we move on, here's our leaf water potential again. Um, so uh, high leaf water potential low. And uh, up here we're getting higher berry weights, lower berry weights down here. And down here where we're getting the lower berry weights, we're also getting um, uh, higher Brix values. Now this is where it gets, uh, I think, quite compelling. This is a different site because uh, it happens to show the relationships a little bit better. And these are leaf water potentials here, um, 05 to 07. And um, these are the, the lower leaf water potential zones here that are, for the most part, temporally stable. And you can see the potentially volatile terpenes that line up um, very nicely with these uh, lower leaf water potentials. Um, so this guy, Paul Boss, this Chateau de Charme, has in fact created some different wine products uh, from this particular block uh, based on these data. And he, so he's quite uh, excited and quite happy with these data. About five, minutes. five minutes? Okay, no problem. Talk fast. Um, so when we look at some of the, the wine and uh, look at uh, sensory, uh, over on this side, this is PLS analysis, partial least squares analysis. We see what's related. Things like water potential, soil moisture, sand content, berry weight, vine size. Basically that was 75% of the data set and that's basically the basis for terroir right there. And we're getting very different wines that are associated with the high soil moisture, high water potential. Uh, so things uh, high in citrus and mineral, uh, but also uh, vegetal and things like that. Over on this side, um, a little bit more um, uh, peach, apple, uh, baking spice and things of that nature. So we're getting very different wines depending on whether we've got high or low soil moisture. Uh, so that to me has got a lot to do with what terroir is all about. The other thing is, is we were able to, to look at this on a regional basis as well uh, because we had all those different sub-appellations. We look at uh, uh, some of these different uh, zones. Here's uh, some lakeshore vineyards right here um, that were associated with mineral, citrus, uh, vegetal, and things like that. And some of the um, uh, other areas, the, uh, some of the bench areas over here uh, that were associated more with uh, baking spice and tropical fruit and things of that nature. So there did seem to be some um, uh, truth to, to the, these sub-appellations. I don't think there's 10 of them, but there's probably at least three anyway. All right, uh, a few uh, comments about Cabernet Franc. Essentially the same project. Um, you can see some of the relationships here. Uh, things like percent clay and uh, um, perhaps not uh, any surprise to you, it uh, got a nice relationship to things like calcium and potassium and uh, things like base saturation and soil pH. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, uh, um, spatial relationships here. Um, for the most part, uh, temporal stability. Um, this is uh, soil moisture, and you can see, especially in 06 and 07, those soil moisture zones were, were almost mirror images of each other. Not so much 2005, and I'm not sure why that is. I'll walk you through uh, Shadow de Charme. These are uh, low water status zones here in the, uh, the upper part of this block in the north. And as you uh, look at some of the other variables, you can see that things such as, uh, for instance, leaf water potential uh, is related to lower berry weights, uh, higher bricks, higher anthocyanins, higher phenols, and, and things of that nature. So uh, once you've, you know some of this information, you can have a pretty good idea of um, what you might get in terms of some, uh, some variables that, that really mean something to you. And PLS, once again, uh, we got high water status over here, low water status over here associated with color and red fruit and phenols and things like that. High water status associated with, uh, in particular, uh, bitterness and, and green fruit and, and uh, things of that nature. 
And once again, we did some regional uh, assessment here, and we look at uh, these particular blocks, uh, uh, these four are all waterfront properties. So they're all uh, associated with either Lake Ontario or the Niagara River, so cooler sites. And these are all associated with things like green bean and bell pepper. So there's most definitely uh, some relationship between um, location and uh, wine sensory. So we did feel that we uh, uh, were able to uh, uh, verify some of these subappellations. So in terms of these Cabernet and uh, Riesling studies, um, we, we felt that there, there were some clear relationships between uh, things like soil and vine water status, as well as uh, and things such as uh, uh, free and bound terpenes in Riesling and, and some of the phenolic analytes in uh, Cabernet Franc. And I think that's really the one major take home me uh, message. And I think the other one is, is that there was nice temporal stability from year to year uh, with a lot of these relationships. So if you can get in there and you can get some data, um, you can have something that probably is going to repeat itself year after year. So I'm going to probably take a couple more minutes if I may and then I think I can uh, finish off. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of mentions of uh, some of this remote sensing work that we did um, using uh, uh, Riesling and uh, Pinot Noir. So Similar projects looking at uh, uh, soil moisture, uh, leaf water potential, but we had the added uh, set of data in that we were doing a whole lot of uh, flyovers and collecting some uh, spectral reflectance data uh, as a result of the flyovers. And uh, this is one place, this was uh, 30 bench vineyards, uh, consisted of a whole series of these sub-blocks that we were able to delineate. Um, this was a 25 acre Riesling block. We collected about 520 um, uh, vines, or collected data from 520 vines, so a lot of work, and collected things like soil moisture every year and leaf water potential and so on and so forth. So we were getting some nice uh, temporal stability at least three out of four years for soil moisture. 2009 it never stopped raining and so we uh, didn't see that nice temporal stability when uh, we got to 2009. And uh, the same goes for leaf water potential. We're seeing the low leaf water potential here in that, uh, that triangle zone. And uh, 2009, not so much. All right, I think I better um, finish this up. And so what I'd like to do is I'm just going to skip ahead to the, uh, the end because we've got some work it's ongoing that we're, where we're looking at the terroir winter hardiness. And that's uh, Mary Jasinski's project. Uh, so I'm just going to skip ahead about three or four slides to that. And then I can uh, take some questions. Okay, so with this, what we're doing is uh, we're essentially mapping winter hardiness and looking at uh, LT50 values, uh, lethal temperature 50 values and seeing how they might relate to things like soil moisture and leaf water potential. The hypothesis being is that we would find lower LT50 values in zones of vineyards that had um, somewhat lower soil moisture during the growing season and uh, lower leaf water potential. So maybe touching on almost water stress. And yes, indeed, we were finding in a lot of these vineyards that there was um, a relationship between uh, soil moisture, leaf water potential, and uh, LT50 in uh, a great many of these vineyards. What was the range on the LT50? Oh, that's a good question. And it, it's going to differ from uh, vineyard to vineyard. Um, roughly minus 19 to minus 26 or thereabouts. C. C, yeah, C. And here's another example. We, we can see this low yielding area is also associated with low LT50 values. And so uh, we're finding that not just that, but also associated with higher anthocyanins and higher phenolics. So there's also the quality benefit that comes along with this. 
Okay, and we're finding that there's a temporal effect as well, and we're finding that uh, uh, a zone of low LT50 expands as you move into winter and as those vines acclimate a little bit more. And then it will shrink again if you're starting to uh, look at LT50 values in late February or early March. So you're seeing that deacclimation effect and you're seeing a, a, a change in the, the size of these LT50 patterns. Okay, I think I can skip over that one and just kind of go over to, uh, to conclusions. Um, so I would say that geomatics has allowed us to, to conclude that uh, uh, that this terroir effect is uh, associated with things such as soil and vine water status and uh, to some extent also uh, yield and possibly vine size. And I think those things probably account for a large per, uh, percentage of the ter terroir effect. Um, uh, these technologies have also allowed us to, to verify and validate uh, sub-appellations within the Niagara region and uh, I think that uh, coupled with remote sensing, we might be able to uh, help uh, growers uh, delineate and define some sub-blocks that they might be able to use for, for economic gain. Uh, I'm hoping that this uh, work will also allow us over a period of years to uh, be able to show growers uh, high and low risk um, winter injury areas within their, their vineyard blocks. And that might mean that they can uh, um, cluster thin portions of vineyard blocks in order to enhance winter hardiness, for instance. Um, I, I think the last thing to, to mention in that is, is that uh, any vineyard variable can be mapped. And um, any vineyard variable can be um, uh, looked at in terms of its spatial variability and in terms of its uh, um, spatial correlation with other variables. So um, whether it's a whole bunch of soil variables and things like that, you can uh, relate those with things that are going to mean money for you, yield, fruit composition, and things of that nature. So uh, I think with that, I better uh, stop. I've gone over a few minutes, and uh, so I'd like to save some time for questions. So thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if I've worked in a vineyard where uh, I, I would see a $5 section, maybe a $15 section, and, and most definitely there's some uh, areas or zones within those vineyards where they would um, uh, um, probably be able to create a $35 or $40. But yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think that... Uh, um, some effort would have to be made to bring up the potential value of that uh, um, low value zone uh, before I'd start thinking about uh, uh, selling that $40 bottle. Okay, uh, good question. With the uh, um, destructive sampling, we were usually looking at uh, a rate of um, 75 to 100 vines to the hectare and uh, generally in a, um, a grid, try to look at it something like an, an eight by eight meter grid or something of, of that nature. So it's quite a, quite a big area. It's a big area, so. yeah. Um, that, that one block we had uh, 25 acres and we had about 500 vines that we uh, took from that uh, 25 acres. So yeah, I think you're always trying to uh, uh, create that balance between, well, how much have I got time to do and um, how detailed can I get and, and make sure that I've got something that I have full confidence in. And so, yeah, we, we figured around 75 to 100 per hectare or in some cases more. Well, so all of, all of our uh, yield maps, that was all um, uh, uh, from uh, hand harvested. Oh, I thought you said you had a machine. But there was, uh, that, was Joan that was Joe Davenport's uh, data from Washington where she had the, the machine. So that would have been uh, continuous. Uh, that's a good question, and that's certainly what uh, 
Bramley and some of those guys have been uh, trying to do in Australia is to do some of these flyovers or use Greenseeker in order to get NDVI maps and associate those with uh, either yield or, or bind size or both and, and they have been fairly successful in doing that. Um, and gen I, I skipped over a few of those slides but uh, we were quite successful actually in uh, uh, seeing some nice relationships between NDVI and, and yield and bind size. And uh, yeah, so I, I think that's possible. Um, there also seem to be some nice relationships between NDVI and uh, things like leaf water potential and, and, and bricks and, uh, and color and things like that. The, the data that I've seen from our lab and, and others seems, seem to indicate that there is a nice correlation there. So yeah, if you can get a green seeker or uh, something like that, I think you're all set. Okay, thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.